Vedanta is a means of uh, self-knowledge or freedom. Freedom means uh, freedom from dependence on objects. An object being anything other than your own consciousness or your own self. And uh, depending on objects, people, places, things, situations, emotions, thoughts, ideas, etc., 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 experiences, uh, is a problem for uh, humans. Uh, there's nothing wrong with engaging in objects. You have no choice about it. You're here. You have a body. There's a world around you. Things are happening 24-7. Uh, and uh, you have to engage. And you can either engage happily or you can engage for happiness. So, and most of us engage uh, objects for happiness. In other words, we're coming from a position of, of insufficiency, incompleteness, and lack. And we assume that uh, the objects that present themselves to our awareness, to our consciousness, to ourselves, uh, those objects can in fact fulfill this need to be whole and complete. If you feel that you're incomplete, you want to feel that you're whole and complete, you want to feel complete. And you do temporarily feel okay, you feel satisfied and happy when you get what you want. Uh, unfortunately, what's the, there's a downside to this uh, picture that um, getting what you want doesn't solve the problem of wanting at all. I get what I want and you would think, well, I get what I want and then I should be happy. Uh, did, anybody, did you ever have sex once? No, you never had, it's, you know, if sex was so wonderful, you'd have it once, and that would be all you'd need, right? But you don't, do you? You suddenly become dependent upon that because it feels good. It erases this sense of incompleteness and insufficiency momentarily until the next desire comes up. And that cycle of desire and action, we call it samsara, it's a life of a continual um, attachment and sorrow, suffering, anger. All our emotions come from that pursuit of objects. Uh, simply because the objects are not under our control. What happens is not under the conscious control of human beings. Uh, big problem. Because we want this stuff, but we don't have any control over the objects. You, you can't make somebody love you. You can't make somebody give you a great job. You can't, uh, you know, all your fantasies are not going to be fulfilled uh, on the basis of your own uh, power, on the basis of your own knowledge or your own actions. It just doesn't happen that way. You're dependent upon the objects that present themselves to your awareness 24-7. And that bondage is, is painful. Uh, where at, and therefore, uh, people seek freedom from bondage, freedom from dependence on externals. An external is anything, anything other than you. By you, we mean, we don't mean the person on your driver's license, that person that you think you are. You know, when the cop stops you on the on the, at the traffic stop and says you've been violating the rules um, and you show him, he says, who are you? And you show him your driver's license. That's not the you we're talking about, okay? The person that was born at this time and dies at that time and has a, a number of experiences in between birth and death. That's not the you we're talking about when we say you. By you, we mean your consciousness, your existence. And there's, Nobody ever actually had to tell you that you exist, did they? Did anybody ever say you, you exist? Did, it, did your mother, and father, when you popped out of the womb, did your mom say, Now son, I want you to know, understand, you exist. Huh? Or you're conscious. Did, did any, anybody, did your teachers tell you that? Did the government tell you that? Did anybody ever tell you that? Nobody ever said that to you.
Why? Because it's obvious. It's a self-evident fact that I exist and that I'm conscious. My existence and my consciousness being the same thing. I can't exist unless I know that I exist. In other words, it requires knowledge to know that I exist. And I can't have knowledge unless I exist. So, existence and consciousness, what? Same thing. So that's what we call yourself. And that self is free of, what? Dependence on objects. So, the picture I'm painting now is, we've got two selves, even though Vedanta says that's not true, there's only one self appearing as two. But to begin with, we need to accept ourselves as this person that we think we are with all these desires and fears searching for satisfaction in the world of objects. And we, when we realize that that doesn't work, we get, why? Because the objects are not under our control, and life is a zero-sum game. Means what? Zero-sum means that for every upside, there's a downside. For every downside, there's an upside, which means you can't beat the system here. You can't win. You can't get wildly happy here, nor can you get wildly unhappy here. For instance, I'll give you an example. Say you're lonely and you want love. Okay. So, then, you know, our eyes meet across a crowded satsang. You know, the energy, the shakti, and the, all, you know, all excitement comes. And then, you know, your, your place or mine, and then we hook up and this, every, everything's wonderful. Now I've solved my loneliness problem, haven't I? I've got my significant other. But what does it cost me? My independence. And what comes right along with that? Anxiety. Because I'm now depending upon you for what? For my happiness, for to relieve my sense of loneliness, aren't I? And I'm always worried that this object that I possess, it can be anything, right, is heading south because everything in this apparent reality is heading south. It's changing. It's never the same from one moment to the next, is it? See the problem? And what we try to do uh, as human beings is to solve this problem in the world. And we're saying, Vedanta says, no, you can't do that. From the, from the level of the problem, you cannot solve the problem. You have to step outside the problem to solve this problem of suffering. And that solution is available right here now. It's not, a, a, they call it, we call it enlightenment. You probably all heard that word. It's taught to us in the modern spiritual world. The Neo-Advaita people and the yogis and various all these very spiritual uh, teachings is that enlightenment is something, an event that's going to happen in time. Right? I'm not enlightened now, but something's going to happen later on in the future if I just do these particular practices, if I do my yogas, if I practice my meditation, if I chant my mantras, if I hang out with this guru, get my hug from Amaji, the great saint, or hang out with the Dalai Lama, or get my kundalini all excited and so forth and so on. Right? It's the idea. It's a, somehow I can do my way out of this world by performing some action. And Vedanta says, no, that doesn't work. Why? Because reality is not a, the duality that it seems. Duality means what? Duality means that the, the belief that, the, that the, the experience that the subject and object, me and what I'm seeking for, are actually two different things. And Vedanta says it's not true. They're not two different things. They're both the same. They're non-different. That's what non-dual means. There's no difference between the subject and the object. Now that's really weird, isn't it? That's a very difficult uh, theorem, let's say. We'll call it a theorem that we need to prove because it's totally counterintuitive, isn't it? 
I actually experience things this way, and Vedanta says, no, you can't trust your experience in this case. Experience is not a valid means of knowledge. What? Knowledge means what? Self-knowledge. Because this self, this existence consciousness that I am, is totally free of all objects. Existence doesn't depend upon any objects for its existence, does it? If I am one with that existence, uh, I'm free of all the objects that depend upon me for their existence. Consciousness doesn't require any other consciousness to be conscious. <laughs> it's all sentient beings uh, depend upon consciousness for their consciousness. We borrow consciousness from consciousness itself. <laughs> so, the problem is that this self, this existence consciousness that I am, is not available through action. Yet we're told, and this is what the so we're told that it is available through action, and we say, no, it's not available action, through action. Why? Because reality is non-dual. Now that means that if consciousness is free, then, then what? You're free right now. If there's only consciousness, that's non-dual means what? There's only consciousness, existence. And if that's true, then your freedom is not, and, and consciousness is free of all the objects that appear in it. Then what? There, there is no way that you can obtain your consciousness except through knowledge. In other words, we don't have an experience problem here as human beings if we're searching for freedom. We have an ignorance problem. Now, ignorance means what? We don't know that we're whole and complete. We don't know that we're this existence consciousness that doesn't depend upon anything. We don't know that we're ever free and, and always and immortal. Because what isn't born and what doesn't die is immortal. So that problem of change in mortality is taken care of also by through self-knowledge. Now, <clears throat> If I don't have a, an experience problem, because if reality is non-dual and everything is only existence consciousness, is me, huh, then I'm already experiencing this, this free, I'm already free, right? I'm, all, I'm already free. There's nothing I can do to obtain that. Even, even, and you know, we know that there's nothing we can do to attain it. Why? Because the doer of actions, what, is a limited entity. You, this is your own experience as a doer of actions, isn't it? That you have very limited power. You can do an action, but that action, will that act, any action you do, or have, let's put it this way, has any action you've ever done produced a limitless result? No, it hasn't. It can't. Why? Because a limited entity cannot produce a limitless result. Which means that freedom, which is limitless, limitlessness, hmm, is unavailable through action. So action is not a valid mean, action, meaning experience. Getting an experience of freedom at some time in the future is not available huh, for, is not useful. I mean, actually, the reason I'm sitting talking to you here is because I wrote a book called How to Attain Enlightenment. It was an ironic title. Uh, and in the second chapter, I, I don't have time to really go through the whole thing here. I do seminars on this topic uh, that, you know, sometimes last three or four days. But I, I wrote, in the second chapter, I pointed out the logic, uh, the fallacy behind the thinking that in the modern spiritual world and why these modern spiritual teachings just amount to a lot of frustration. Because they're promising you something in the future that you already have in the present. And they're, they're knowledge averse. The modern spiritual world is incredibly anti-intellectual. They're all in about feelings and experience and so forth and so on. And they don't want to hear that there's something they don't know. They think that, oh, the mind needs to be what? Killed. The ego needs to be destroyed, and then your problems are going to go away. Well, that's a great theory, but have, has your mind ever stopped thinking? 
Has your ego ever gone away? No, it hasn't. There's nothing wrong with your mind or your ego. Huh? It's just what the content of your thoughts is is a problem. The thoughts themselves, there's nothing they're value neutral, but the content of those thoughts bother you. And there's no contradiction between who you are, the ever free conscious self that you are, and your thoughts, is there? Because you're present, aware, and conscious when you're having thoughts, good or bad, aren't you? Isn't that right? There's no contradiction. So by eliminating my thoughts, I don't eliminate me. <laughs> Do I? Because I'm present. Think about it. Look at your own experience. And Vedanta is just the analysis of experience. That's all it is. When an object appears in you, let's say a thought, an experience. An experience is consciousness me plus the thought that's appearing in, in me at the moment. When a thought appears in me, do I appear simultaneously with that thought? Or am I present before the thought comes? That's correct. The answer is yes. You can nod your head up and down. The answer is yes. You're present, what? The thought, the I'm here, and then the thought appears. Now, the thought has a certain length. It has a certain duration. It exists for a certain duration. And that's my experience, whatever the thought is. The sex thought, the money thought, the food thought, the wife thought, the kid thought, the dog thought, the satsang thought, the enlightenment thought, whatever it is. It lasts for a period of time. Uh, and do, 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 I, do I modify when that thought happens? In other words, does my awareness actually change when the thought appears? It, it's a tough question because it seems to sometimes. If I identify with the substance, in other words, the reflected awareness that appears as my mind, yes, it seems as if I am changing when the thought changes. But actually, you're right. You don't change when a thought is passing through you. Now, when the thought disappears, do, do you disappear? No, you, you remain, huh? And, and when the next thought comes, have you been contaminated by that previous thought, or do you see that second thought as clearly as you saw the first thought? You haven't been contaminated, have you? Which shows what? That you, consciousness, existence, is unaffected by what? By your mind. Your feelings, your thoughts, the objects, the experiences, the emotions, and so forth that present themselves to you. That's what we mean by freedom. So here I am. I actually am free, but I don't feel free. Why? Because I identify myself with the thoughts and feelings, with the experiences, the thoughts and feelings that keep appearing in me. I don't right, identify with the knower or the witness of those thoughts. Now, which means what? As I said earlier, I've got an ignorance problem, uh, not an experience problem. Now, for ignorance, uh, what, what, how do I get rid of ignorance? Simple. I need knowledge. Action doesn't remove ignorance. Action's in harmony with ignorance. In other words, I'm ignorant of my wholeness and completeness, therefore I do actions to get whole and complete. So the more actions I do, the more my sense of incompleteness is reinforced, isn't it? So, huh? So action isn't going to take care of my ignorance. But knowledge takes care of my ignorance. Now for knowledge, huh, this is very tricky, I need a means of knowledge. Knowledge just doesn't happen on its own. For you to see me here, you need eyes. For you to feel what I'm feeling, you need what? Emotions. For you to understand what I'm saying, you need an intellect. Those are means for your, these three basic levels of experience. Physical experience, emotional experience, and intellectual experience. They all have means, appropriate means that we've been supplied by the universe or God or the cosmos or whatever. Never mind, we won't get into that right now. 
But the problem with me, consciousness, existence, consciousness, is what? What's the problem with that? As far as the known means of knowledge, the means of knowledge that are at my disposal right now. Yourself cannot be objectified. You cannot try. Try right now to take yourself, your consciousness, your existence, and uh, turn it into an object and, and observe it. Can you do that? Can you? No, you can't. That's correct. You cannot. Yourself can never be made into an object. There's not another self behind it watching it and another self behind it watching it and so forth and so on. Ad infinitum ad nauseum. Uh, the, the self is the part of you that doesn't change, that's always present and is totally unaffected by whatever happens. And that can never be an object. So the means of knowledge that I've been given by existence is what? Inadequate perception and inference, in other words. These are the two means that I have at my disposal. I can perceive things and I can infer things based upon perceptions. And those are both valid means of knowledge for objects. However, they're invalid means of knowledge for the subject, the self. Consciousness, or the self. Existence. Ta-da! Danta is a means of knowledge that reveals your existence, your consciousness to be ever free and hut. And gives you a direct apprehension, direct understanding of your limitless, ever free, ever present nature. Now how does it do that? It doesn't promise you a special experience. Why? Because you are not a special experience. <laughs> you, uh, you, are, uh, you are eternal, ever present awareness, consciousness. There's nothing special about it. It's totally ordinary. Everybody, every sentient being experiencing exactly the same thing. So it doesn't promise you this transcendental orgasm and the light of lights and all, you know, all this, all this masturbatory spiritual BS that, that you see in, I, sh I shouldn't look around the bookstore here, but there's, <laughs> there's oh, sorry, sorry Watkins. Uh, uh, Promising you all of this wonderful, you know, nirvanas and satoris and samadhis and so forth and so on. We don't, we don't promise you that because you are already got it. You already are it. So, huh? But what we, what we, so why is it then that if I already got it, if I'm already free and happy and complete and whole, that I don't appreciate that, I don't experience that? Why not? Because I'm ignorant of what? Of who I am. Now, what does that ignorance appear as? Ignorance is ignorance. It can be anything. But how does that ignorance appear to me? It appears in the form of beliefs and opinions. Hmm? Unsubstantiated, un, uh, unevaluated beliefs and opinions that I have about myself and the world. Not anything that I'm actually responsible for. Stuff that, starting with mom and pop, was dumped into me. Hmm? Mom and pop are not your friends, spiritually, okay? Yeah, they were lovely people. Yes, they gave you everything and blah, blah, blah. And they hugged you and fed you and sent you to school and all that. But they were really not your friends spiritually. Why? Because they were conduits for what? All of the ignorance uh, of, uh, of the truth that has been uh, been available to human beings since day one. They told you basically you're small, you're inadequate, you're incomplete, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you need to do this. They encouraged you to have lots of desires, they encouraged you to go out there and chase those objects and get that uh, you know trophy wife and that good job and that house with a picket fence in the suburbs and blah 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 blah. They, they're the ones who fed you with that ignorance, and you can't blame them, okay? Because their parents did the same to them, and so on and so forth, right back to the very beginning. So, the only thing that's standing in my way is what? Is these concepts that I developed, which I take to be knowledge. 
I don't, huh? They're unexamined, my, they're, they're unexamined conclusions that I've drawn based upon my what? My own experience. Now maybe, maybe you have um, come to certain correct conclusions about life just willy-nilly without even knowing that it was knowledge. Understand? You, you may have, but let's face it. Have you actually sat down and like gone through, carefully gone through all of your thoughts and feelings and emotions and all your conclusions and what you think is your knowledge and winnowed it out to determine what was actually true and what, what isn't true? Have you actually done that? No, most of us haven't. Yet it's that very stuff that keeps bothering us. Now, how does Vedanta deal this? Deal with this. Vedanta is a means of knowledge. It's thousands of years old. It's not my teaching. I just happen to be a teacher of Vedanta. It comes from Vedic culture, India, um, a long, long time ago. No one knows where, when exactly. We say it's an eternal tradition. And what does it do? It has a number of inquiries. Ways of thinking, you know, scientific ways to think about reality that what, reveal to you the unexamined logic of your own experience. So what we're saying is you actually do know who you are somewhere inside yourself. That's actually, that's why you're seeking to be free. Because that part of you that is free wants to be free and it sends you seeking. So you do really know that somewhere deep inside, but because there's this huge overlay of thoughts and emotions and experiences and beliefs and opinions and memories and so forth, desires and fantasies, all that stuff is hanging on top of it, you, you never really get any direct access to what you really know. So Vedanta, using these methods, we have very, very practical methods. It's, it's not a, there's nothing mystical about Vedanta at all. It's just practical method to inquire to what? Reveal to you what you already know. And that needs to be, needs to be taught you, to you. You can't read your way to enlightenment. Uh, honestly, you, you know, if you could have figured it out that you were free, uh, you would have, and you'd be free and happy, but nobody is. People have happiness experiences here and there when they get things that they want, but you rarely meet a human being who's totally free and happy and satisfied and blissful and indifferent to what happens. We're not saying there's anything wrong with what happens, but we're not saying there's anything right with what happens. We're saying that what happens is zero sum with reference to your happiness. That huh? for every upside there's a downside, for every downside there's an upside. So there's no solution here in this world. You cannot beat the system. That's that's it. That's our premise. Now, if this knowledge needs to be taught to you, um, hopefully you can uh, re read read some of my books. I should, uh, or look at some of the videos and try to get an idea of what of some of these teachings. One of these teachings is, is uh, the yoga of the three energies and I'll explain to that to you in a minute what, what that is and how it works. Because this is not, this is a technique or this is a, this is a kind of practice you can do one to set yourself free and two to purify your mind. Now when we say purify your mind means what? Get rid of those concepts and ideas and beliefs and opinions that are producing suffering. Because what you think and feel is not etched in granite. It may feel like it's etched in granite, but it's not. Thoughts are interchangeable. Thoughts are removable. You can put new thoughts and you can introduce a cognitive shift into your mind huh, if you want to. If you, if you understand the reason for it and the need to, the need for it understand so my problem is what i don't understand the statement that i'm free that i'm unborn limitless ordinary unconcerned ever present actionless awareness existence awareness that's a statement that's a basic statement that vedanta makes i am 
whole and complete, non-dual, ever-present, ordinary, actionless, unconcerned, existence awareness. We can throw in some other statements. All of those are synonyms. All of them equal the same thing. They're just different words to talk about me, who I really am. So, if I don't understand what that means, then my, my mind, which is my means of knowledge, needs to be prepared to understand it. We're not saying it's not understandable. It's not understandable unless your mind is capable of understanding it. Because I know, when I say this, I see a lot of people saying, what is he talking about? Has this guy lost his mind? Is he on something? This is very strange. He's saying, I don't understand. I, I, don't, I know for sure I'm not ordinary, actionless, ever-present, non-dual, uh, blah, 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 awareness, <laughs> existence awareness. Huh? Say, he must have lost his mind. No. If, if I, I can understand this, but I can't understand that when I'm so, what, when my mind is so cluttered with these unexamined notions, these ideas and beliefs and opinions. Because I tend to take ignorance for knowledge. I don't know the difference between ignorance and knowledge. So, huh? So, and I, you know, in good faith, I think that my ignorance is knowledge. And therefore, what? I suffer. So, my mind is the problem. We're getting down here to the yoga of the energies. My mind is the problem, and I need a mind that's clear and capable of what? Of self-inquiry, uh, which will, in self-inquiry, the purpose of self-inquiry is self-knowledge, which will what? Produce self-knowledge. So Vedanta is a, a, a method of self-inquiry that produces self-knowledge. It's not like a normal action in the world. A normal action in the world does not produce self-knowledge. It just produces more experience. Whereas inquiry produces knowledge, and knowledge removes ignorance. So to get, to get rid of my ignorance, not to get myself because I already have myself, but to get rid of my ignorance, what do I need to do? I need to prepare my mind. Now, you'll spend 10 or 20 years, or 10 years at least, qualifying for some kind of normal job, do doctor, lawyer, whatever it is, you'll invest tr tremendous amount of effort qualifying for a certain position that will give you some kind of modicum of security here in the world. Why shouldn't you have to work a little bit on your mind to understand this statement, huh, the meaning of these words that are going to set you free? That, If you really wanted freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from samsara, from dependence upon objects. You will. And there are a lot of people who have. And many people now, since the 60s in the West, have actually done good spiritual work. And their minds are actually fairly well prepared for, to understand this truth. That I am free. That I am whole. That I am complete. That I need nothing. That nothing can be added to me or subtracted from me. These are all statements that we find in our scripture. Therefore, <laughs> I need to purify my mind. And we have to, we're not just going to leave you hanging. See, the modern teachers, they just say, Oh, your consciousness. Oh, you're the self. Oh, your awareness. Just experience it. It will happen one fine day. And you say, but I don't feel that way. They say, well, too bad. But just keep doing what you're doing, and one day you'll get it. Frustrates the hell out of you. I get hundreds of letters every year maybe more, uh, from people telling me about the frustrations they've had at the hands of these modern teachers who tell them the truth but have no what means for what? Getting them to there. There's no actual practical everyday uh, work that a person can do to achieve the, this freedom, to, to remove this ignorance and gain this freedom. Whereas Vedanta has a whole system for qualifying you. We're not saying that action is useless. In fact, we're going to encourage you to act. Well, the, the, the modern ones don't like it to say, Oh no, there's no free will, you see. It's all, you have no free will, so you can't do anything to get enlightened, so you shouldn't do anything. 
that's a common. Ramesh uh, Balsakar was a great proponent of the, of the, you know, you're not the doer. And therefore you can't do knowledge, therefore there's no guru, there's no ignorance, there's no actions to be done, there's no, 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 no. So th those people's spiritual work was what? Not doing. Well, what's not doing going to get you? Nothing, because you're always doing something. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you're always doing something. Even, huh? And that I can't do anything to get enlightened is just an excuse, what? To, to not want to put forth the effort to work on yourself. So we have a number of methods, quite a few, but basic one is called karma yoga. Karma yoga neutralizes your likes and your dislikes, your fears and desires, and renders them reasonably non-binding. It's a daily practice. It's based upon a certain fundamental truth, and that truth is what? You have the right to act, but you don't have any right to the result. And therefore what? Therefore, all of your emotions that are associated with getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want are completely illegitimate because it's not up to you. If you understood that what? Th that the results of your action were out of your hands, you'd be basically emotion free. Because all your emotions are not generated by mom and pop and the federal government and Donald Trump and all, you know. That's, those things are not producing the, the emotional issues for you. What are they, what's producing the emotional issue? I'm not getting what I want right here now. Simple. My wife isn't giving me what I want. My husband's not getting, my kids are not, blah, 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 blah. You name it. Every minute that, uh, an emotion comes up, there's some frustration there, there's, there's some lack of appreciation of what you've got, and some complaint about what you have, or don't have. So karma yoga, that's the first basic technique. Then we have what we call upasana yoga. These are all, once you get your mind, we call it karma yoga burnout insurance, or, or stress reduction. It's a very basic, simple thing. You don't have to spend any money at it. You don't have to read a whole lot of books. If you just understand the basic idea and you start putting it into practice, I tell you, you'll get really happy in a short time. It won't, it won't take long. Seriously. It, it's incredibly powerful technique. But it's difficult by it because it's counterintuitive. And plus, I'm conditioned to being emotional. In fact, in my case, my emotions are doing my thinking. The normal worldly person doesn't think with their intellect, they think with their emotions. There's a reversal. The intellect plays handmaiden to the emotions and the emotion does all the thinking. The karma yoga will, will sort you very quickly and that'll get you reasonably calm in your daily life. It's not running off to India or anything like that, staying right where you are, working in your job, whatever it is in your family, doing them with this attitude. And then Upasana Yoga is a whole bunch of techniques like meditation, prayer, etc., 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 all of this, all of the techniques that you find in the yoga world. Good techniques, excellent techniques that are available for what? For steadying, refining, and purifying your mind. Getting your mind still and clear and, and one-pointed and focused. And then the third technique is called Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga is knowledge yoga and that's called Vedanta. Now Vedanta has what? Vedanta has three stages. One is listening, two is reflecting, and three is assimilating. To understand, in other words, n now that my mind is capable of understanding, I need to uh, know what I need to know and I need to assimilate that knowledge. And assimilate that knowledge is difficult. Why? Because well, I have a whole lot of beliefs to the contrary. So in the first stage, I learn, I've learned, I've, I've got my mind calm enough so that I can actually hear what the teacher is saying, what the teaching is saying. You don't, you can't interpret Vedanta. If you're there, sitting there thinking, 
if you're trying to like fit this into the picture of what you know or what you don't know spiritually, and most of you people probably have a lot of spiritual knowledge, Vedanta won't work. It's the hardest thing is to teach spiritual people. It's much easier to set worldly people free with this teaching than it is spiritual people because they're really invested in their beliefs and opinions about what enlightenment is, what they are, what the world is, and so forth and so on. All these, uh, And so listening through that filter that we've developed is very, very difficult. That's why I need to get my mind clear enough so that I can actually hear the teaching as it's meant to be transmitted. Then, in the next stage, huh, once I've, I've got the big picture, then I need to what? Look at what I believe and feel in light of what? What I've heard and discard those bits and pieces that are not in harmony with the pieces that are. I, there are a lot of things that are true. I know a lot of truth. I know a lot of ignorance, but I don't know the difference. So that's called the manana phase or the reflection phase. And then the third stage is what? I need to assimilate that in my life. I need to see that I'm actually living from that what? From that who I really am, from that as existence consciousness here. And actualize that, uh, that knowledge in my own experience. Now, the, another, the fourth technique, which is part of jnana yoga, is called Triguna Vibhava Yoga. That's called the Yoga of the Three Energies. And the, this, tech, this method, and it's, nobody's ever written this up, the, the source of this book are, are the Vedic scriptures and yoga. Yoga and Vedanta Shastras talk about these three gunas, these three energies, here and there scattered all around. They're, they're, nobody ever put it all together and definitely not in English. There were the Sankhya philosophers had some, some kind of rudimentary understanding of them and, and basic understanding of them, but nobody ever really collected all that information together and tied it into the whole picture. I, it was kind of my job sort of fell to me somehow as a as a lineage holder in this Vedanta Sampradaya to do this job and I happen to enjoy it and I've done nothing but Vedanta for the last 50 years I never had an honest job and didn't want one and <laughs> and so I, I collated all this information and explained it how it is that your mind is energy Everybody's interested in energy. Huh? Well, energy is just your mind, your thoughts. And those thoughts are made of three, there are three different kinds of energies that are, what, are built into every human being. Three different basic states of mind. One's called rajas. Now, like, I'm talking pretty fast now. That's called rajas. Because i got to cram a lot of information into you guys in a short time. Normally I'm real laid back and I take it easy and I talk real slow and like, because I've got, you know, three or four days or, or a week to explain it. But now I've got to get you guys enlightened in 30 minutes and, and uh, <laughs> get you to go out a few books and run off to your, you know, your lives, wherever they are. So that's called rajas. Intense energy, spiking energy. It's a mode of passion and desire. It makes the mind agitated. It's a projecting energy. You all know that. It's just, yeah. And uh, the next energy is Thomas. It's called, uh, Thomas is, God, it was such a pain in the ass coming up here. Oh, my God, the trains. And then we got off at the wrong station. And when we came out of that, and oh, I had this big, big fat hamburger just before. And then Alex called and it woke me up. Said, oh, they're waiting to hear you talk. And uh, it's that dull, sleepy, cloudy energy. It's called Avarana Shakti. Shakti means energy. In Sanskrit, Vedanta Sanskrit, and and the third energy is called Sattva Guna. Sattva means what? Still, clear, aware, present energy. It's ideal for what? Knowledge. Raja Guna is not good for knowledge. Your mind's too agitated. You can't. You can't. Con Donald Trump's a good example. They they say that they they say they've reduced they reduced the briefings of Donald Trump's to four minutes on complex international issues because his attention span is about four minutes. 
So after four minutes, you lose him because his mind is going like this. He, maybe he can concentrate, but then it's, it's on to the next. Mind is totally chaotic. It's dominated by this particular kind of energy. It's not his fault. I mean, you may hate him and all that. It's up to you, but it's not his fault that he's just built that way. Now, the third, the the sattva energy is what is clarity, purity, simplicity, uh, presence. When you're feeling good for no reason, you're just huh? You're just here, present, and things make sense. Everything's working. Everything makes sense. You you can understand what's bullshit. You can understand what's the truth. Everything's clear. That's called sattva guna. Now the yoga of the three energies is what is managing the relative proportions of these three energies, what? To produce a mind that's capable of what? Understanding the teaching. If your mind isn't capable of understanding the teaching, there's no sense in trying to understand the teaching. So this, this, this book explains in detail uh, how, what these energies are and, and how it is that you can transform your rajas and the relative proportions of rajas and tamas into a predominantly sattvic mind. Now we're not saying that you shouldn't have rajas because you need rajas to accomplish things. And you've got a karma in this world and you need to have that kind of dynamic extroverted energy to accomplish things. You need tamas also, one, to ground things, it's a very practical grounding energy, and two, to sleep. You're, you're, you should have a third of your life should be Tomasic. That, and when should that third happen? From 10 in the evening till like 6 in the morning or 11 to 7. That's when you should sleep. Understand? If you can manage your that guna, that energy, to work at that time, you'll be in harmony with the cosmic cycles and you'll have plenty of energy. But it's very difficult. Why? Because our societies are completely fucked up. They're completely... huh? We, we've lost all contact with the world. We're living in this bubble of, of rajas energy. The lights never go off. The information never stops. People are like, huh, in bed, they're like staring at this thing, getting information, you know, radiating their heads with the light and, and looking for information and entertainment from these little devices for information coming from within. They're, they're, their minds are just un incapable. They say, why can't I sleep? They, huh? They can't get their thoughts out of their mind to get to sleep. To get to sleep, you need to what? Let your thoughts go. And, they, they, and you're laying there thinking, i, I got to get to sleep. But the, yeah, that's the thought you got to let go. But you can't because your, your mind is in this totally disturbed state all the time. But we need that energy to what? To accomplish things. We need Thomas huh? and we need Rogers. Sattva is the means of knowledge for freedom. So a spiritual life is a life that's based, that manages your gunas. Your gunas are called your qualities, the qualities of your mind. Right? And that manages these energies, what, so that you can set yourself free. See, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't say that guru can set you free. We say knowledge will set you free, but uh, I, you know, I can't set you free. I can maybe set myself free if I understand this teaching and apply it properly. But I can't, you know, I can't fix your mind. I can't prepare your mind, nor can I cause you to what assimilate this information. You're going to have to do the work. Now realizing in the spiritual world that all this baloney about enlightenment happening at some time in the future, or somehow some big guru transmitting some kind of shot, some kind of enlightenment energy into your mind, you know, just willy-nilly out of out of the blue, is just not going to happen. And people are like actually ready to sit down and and think about this, assimilate this knowledge, and do the work. And con consequently, I've become quite well known and go all around the world. I don't even have a place to sit sit down anymore. The the website is just jam packed with you know, it's just it's just I'm busy all the time. I turned down three invitations this week to teach here and there around the world. It's just all all the time because people see the 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 that you know there's no free lunch here. 
you're going to have to do the work. You can't just sit back and think it's some enlightenment's going to happen one fine day. It's not going to happen. Why? Because you're already free. If you weren't free and there was such things as enlightenment, then you could get free, but you're already free. So t just stop thinking that's one day down the line, it's all going to be a bed of roses. It's not. You're going to have to do the work right now here. And to do that, you need karma yoga, jnana yoga, meditation, vipassana yoga, and this managing your energy, learning how to do that. It involves value systems. My God, you can... You can analyze you know we, we've taken this into quite detail so you if you have a doubt about the energies we we uh, analyze and explain all the values that are associated with each kind of energy all the thoughts and emotions that are associated with each kind of energy so you can identify them and, and it involves a serious fearless moral inventory as they say in AA and and it explains the origin of of these the origin of this teaching, and we have some really nice uh, charts that explain the origin of these energies and how the creation functions, the basic uh, metaphysics of this uh, of this teaching and so forth is all laid out here. So uh, if you're in it and talk about love, devotion, how that fits in, we got some great, uh, this Vedanta is an amazing thing, actually. And it, I, think the, I think the world's ready for it. It must be. Because... Uh, I, we just can't keep up. My wife and I, we just can't keep up uh, with the demand. We're publishing everything. We just keep adding to the website, uh, talking more and more, giving more and more seminars and so forth and so on because people are really realizing, hey, I've got to take my, my, take my spirituality in my own hands and do the work. And, and there's actually a, a scientific, non-woo-woo, you know, spiritual... Uh, uh, you know, way to go about this. It's just it's not practical. Just really so. Um, you know, check the website. Um, get some of the books if you want the big picture. If you haven't, uh, uh, I don't understand the big picture. Uh, read uh, How to Attain Enlightenment or Essence of Enlightenment. They're both basically the same book, written in a little different way. That'll give you the big picture, and then you can get into Yoga of Love, the Yoga of the Three Energies. Uh, we're having the yoga of relationships. In other words, applying this teaching to relationships. That'll come out, I think, this month. Uh, it's all it's at the editors now, and it should be coming out this month. We've got, got a huge website, tons of Q&As. I think there are, I was on it today posting another 400 pages that uh, we've written in the last few months um, on, on, um, on all, all these topics with a good search function. There's um, tons of free material. There's YouTube videos, etc., etc., etc. So there's a full resource here of this of this teaching that's available if you're interested. Obviously, we can't sell it to you. I'm not trying to sell it to you. If if it makes sense and you're really sincere, and you really really freedom is a real value for you. A lot of people say, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course I want to be free. Yeah, yeah. Sure, everybody wants to be free, but." Uh, you really need to feel that deep need to, to... I mean, aren't you really fed up with this world? I mean, come on. I know you're not supposed... We're not supposed to say that. We're, you know, the big brother's watching. Mean, big brother means the, the media guys who are selling us all this shit that are, are keeping us, you know, tied down. They don't want to hear. But this is a... It's boring. It's really painful and boring to keep trying to squeeze another little bit of joy out of this shit that they offer to us here? Huh? I mean, isn't it? Come on, yeah, it is. You know, and I, you know, I, fortunately, I, I was 25 when I saw through it. I, 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 you know, I, I figured love out and I figured money out. And that were the only th two things I was interested in was sex and money when I was that age. And, and, and so I just lost interest at it at that time and I've never, I've never been one day away from this knowledge and this teaching since that time because uh, it's so totally satisfying and fulfilling. It put, you know, it just puts you in the driver's seat. You know, you, you, that, that feeling of being controlled by circumstances that I have to do things, I'm supposed to do things, I must do things 
you know, that, that feeling of, of doership and that bondage that comes from obligation and responsibility, uh, it's so painful. I read a statement one time, uh, it was a tribute to the Buddha, but I don't know. It said, a bitten by the vipers of obligation and responsibility, human beings suffer endless rounds of births and deaths in the ocean of samsara. Not nice, you know. Try it, huh? They've got it all dressed up, you know, but it's like lipstick on a pig, you know, <laughs> huh? They, and they, isn't it? Yeah, you know, a pig's a pig. You put lipstick on, it's still a pig. That's it. And, and you know, so anyway, uh, thank you for coming. It was nice to address you. I, I suppose I ran over. I suppose I stayed longer than I was supposed to, but I always do. And I hope that Watkins doesn't uh, mind. And uh, we're doing a seminar this weekend at Reigate, uh, Surrey. Um, it's on uh, Leon's website. What is it? It's on uh, Yoga Ananda. Yoga Ananda. Yeah, uh, there'll be a nice little yoga center down in, in uh, Surrey. And uh, we got stuff planned all over. Um, doing three months in Colorado, uh, in the Rocky Mountains. Any of you are rich and <laughs> you want an outdoors, uh, come to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, we're set, about to buy a place in Spain and set up a, uh, a residence in Spain where we'll have, so we can serve the European people uh, more easily. Uh, I've been just, you know, I can't do it anymore. I'm 77. I've got uh, five new tubes here by the grace of the American medical system. And uh, I need to slow down. So, but anyway, the resources are there, and uh, it's nice to meet you, and God bless you. <laughs> you're not free, but you're, because your ignorance starts to come out as you go, that you can see, you know, you're, but uh, you're apparently free. You know, like, by free, I meant, you know how babies are, how... They don't have a lot of concepts, and they're just so present and alert, and they're so curious, and they're so aware, and they're so lovable. How you just, huh? They're innocent, and huh? What you're seeing there is 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 the is consciousness, is yourself. You were a baby once. And we were all babies once. We were all pure and and, and clear like that. Uh, and uh, but slowly, you know, this enculturation takes place, and and you you get loaded up with you know, concepts, beliefs, and opinions that cloud your, the purity of your awareness. So this is, this is as much about unlearning as it is learning. And, and, and it's for mature people. We, if we don't get, we, you know, everybody here has probably got a few gray hairs. Uh, huh? We don't get kid, young people much. Although in Europe now, quite a lot of younger people, Germans and so forth, are quite interested in this. But I think that's because kids grow up faster nowadays. They, they just have so much experience that sometimes by the time they're 20, 25, that's what happened to me. It was odd at the time. In the 60s, it was odd that you would grow up that fast. But now I meet kids, young people who have been there, done that, seen it all, been through it all, uh, and, and are, are quite mature and dispassionate. And because those those are the fundamental qualifications, you need to be a fairly discriminating, fairly dispassionate person uh, for this to work. If you're really emotional, then you know, do some yoga, go go to a shrink, you know, get yourself sorted, you know, and uh, and then you're ready for this. But uh, it works. So information that sends people to jail. It's a form of knowledge. Well. <laughs> No, no, information and knowledge are different insofar as knowledge is something that you can't negate. No, knowledge is something that's always good, whereas information is, is relative, that is, it's, it's subject to uh, correction. The cab drivers, I mean, their knowledge and the information are very similar. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's right. Knowledge and information, that is, that's kind of, there's a certain kind of, like fire is always hot. Now that's, that's knowledge, isn't it? 
uh, information is it may be you know may have some knowledge component but the point is that this information and knowledge only mean something to a conscious beings to a conscious being in other words what you hear needs to be interpreted and we're, what we supply you with is an impersonal way to interpret what it is that's coming to you, whether it is knowledge or whether it is information, whether it's a belief or an opinion or a fantasy or whatever it is, give you an impersonal way because I'm the last person to really be objective about myself. Yeah. Isn't that right? I mean, we, huh? You're not objective about yourself. All human beings have an agenda. You always think you're either worse than you are or better than you are. You always think how you you got an inflated opinion of yourself or you got a deflated opinion of yourself. But rarely are you clear about what your strengths and weaknesses are. Hmm? So and so we just take it. That's what happened to me. I realized that I wasn't. I was biased about me. And I could see that my biases and my opinions about myself were causing me all kinds of problems. And when I heard this, it just made perfect sense. Here's an objective way, a scientific way of looking at myself that allows me to evaluate things impersonally. And you can count, the thing about knowledge is you can count on it. Whereas beliefs and opinions and information, well, it may be useful, it may not. You don't know, so. Value. But you need to understand what it means. That's all. That, absolutely. There is no doer. But the problem with that concept, is, as it's been presented, is it doesn't explain who is doing. In other words, what is doing. And what Vedanta says is that the, when any, for any action to happen, it requires the blessing of all the factors in the field of existence. We call that God. You could call it God if you want to. We have a, te a technical term that gets away to the God idea. But, like, for example, can you do anything without your, without br if you aren't breathing? No. Cause your breath, but you, and you're not breathing. You're listening to me and the breath is... So, so something's causing your breath to come and go. If your blood's not circulating, uh, if your mind is not working, huh? Your, your mind's alert and assimilating information. Who's doing that? Are you doing that? No. There's some other factor that's putting, you know, that's taking care of all these, uh, the whole environment. So, now I, I can act that I do have a certain kind of limited power to act, but, uh, but am I actually doing when, when all my thoughts, I don't know where my thoughts are coming from? Where, am I, where are your thoughts coming from? Do, do you know what you're going to think in three minutes? No, you don't. So where are those thoughts coming from? Huh? Do you know what feeling you're going to have in, in five minutes? No, you don't. So some, and yet what feelings you have are going to produce actions? Do it. Huh? The thoughts and feelings you have are going to produce actions. So we say, we say that there's a... You know, when you get an idea of what the big picture is, of the whole field of existence and all the factors that are involved in it, then, then you see that it, you are a seeming doer. And that the field, or we call it Ishwar, or God, is actually the doer. See? So you need to have that understanding of the, of the whole picture before you say, I'm not the doer. Right? Now, you know, they could say, as consciousness, you're not the doer. That's another, another, another reason why you're not the doer, because if you're limitless uh, existence awareness, you're obviously not doing, are you? Because you're non-dual. <laughs> if you're non-dual, in other words, if, if reality is non-dual consciousness, then there's, not, no, there's no possibility for action. So there's no doing taking place in consciousness or existence. Existence and consciousness is a substrate in which all actions take place, but it in self doesn't change or do. So from that point of view, as a self, you're not a doer. And as, a, as an individual person, you're not actually a doer either because everything is what? Happening to you. And you're not causing everything to happen. Huh? So the idea that I'm a doer is, is, is a tricky concept. And you need to hear the whole teaching. Once the whole teaching is laid out step by step, then you can see 
you know, what it means to say I'm not the doer. And, and that doesn't preclude action, obviously. And we're saying you do have free will, because this is another question that comes up. If the field is doing it, then how, what can I do? In other words, if everything is predetermined and predestined, then what can I do? Huh? No. In fact, we're arguing uh, that you need to exercise your free will. Because you can actually, your, your actions are an input into the field of existence. So, huh? so the field of existence has to facilitate the karma from your actions. It's out of your hands, but you're actually putting, what, energy into the field. So the field is going to react. If you put, this is a conscious field we're in. Existence is a conscious field. Hmm? So if you put something in, it's going to cause a reaction. It's going to cause a, an, act, an act. It's going to produce a reaction. We call that, that's one meaning of karma. There's a lot of meanings of karma. So, right. If I, if I just sit around and, and smoke dope all day long and drink my beers and say, I'm waiting for my enlightenment, what's the, what's the field going to give me? More dope and more beer and more talk about enlightenment. That's all. Hmm? You know, it's just logical. That's my input. That's what I'm putting into the field, so the field is going to give that back. If I, like, if I, like, decide that I need to what? work on myself and I do the actions necessary, those actions are going to invoke the field and the field is going to produce the results that are appropriate to the actions. Now we're saying, you know, if you follow this program, these are the actions, that, these are the thoughts you need to produce the actions that are going to produce a kind of mind that's going to what? Get you clear about who you are. So we're saying, yes, there's no free will, but yes, there's free will. <laughs> like, uh, it's not an either or. And Vedanta is very difficult because, because the intellect is trained to, in duality. It's bipolar. It thinks, if it thinks, if, if you know, if it, 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 day and night cannot exist together. If it's day, it's not night. If it's night, it's not day. If I'm sick, I'm not healthy. If I'm healthy, I'm not sick. Huh? It, things like that. Now we're saying that's not true because there's a third factor, and that's yourself. And when you look at yourself from the point of view of duality, then what? Both and are true. There are, huh? There's, it's possible to say there is no doer, and it's possible to say there is a doer. And, huh? Why? Because there's a third perspective. And the third perspective is presented by the teachings of Vedanta. Hard. It's counterintuitive simply because of my conditioning. You know, that, that, that idea I talked about earlier about uh, killing your ego or, or stopping your mind. The stopping your mind teaching. That, the idea there is what? I'm, 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 I'm free when I'm not thinking. Huh? And, and I'm not free when I'm thinking. So I need to get rid of my thoughts, and then I'm going to be enlightened. I'm going to be free. And I tried to point out earlier that that's not true. If the I, the self, is, is what it is, i.e. existence awareness, it's in no way in contradiction to thought. So I'm always present and aware even when I'm thinking thoughts. So there's no reason, huh? Except as a method, maybe, to, to see yeah, it's just, just see, understand the mind. And I need to get out of the mind to understand it. And unfortunately, what you have is that, is that all, most of these teachings in the modern spiritual world are coming from the mind, but they're talking, they're pretending that they're coming from a state of non duality. So they're talking non duality, but they're actually huh, teaching duality. And it's real confusing. I, I mean, I've just, I hear these stories. I mean, people who spend 10 or 20 years with these teachers just going, being driven crazy because they could not, uh, they, 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 they knew that the, there was truth in non-duality, but they had no way to really understand what it was because nobody's been taught. Generations of people run over to India and read these books and gone to these swamis and, and sorry, cherry-picked little pieces of information that they thought was really cool or got them really high or went to a satsang or read a book or a scripture or something like that and they kind of cobbled together a teaching out of, you know, out of bits and pieces 
but the Vedanta is like totally vetted. It hasn't changed for 10,000 years. This teaching's worked for 10,000 years. There's no, you can't change it. It's set up in such a way that you can't pollute it or change it. It's, it's just impossible. But, but huh? so you need to, you know, subject your mind to this teaching until it's clear, and then, then you're, uh, then you got the, you know, you're good to go. There's a feeling of empowerment, and, and, you know, it's so amazing. And, and life is just a joy once you understand. But if you're just trying to, like, make things work, and keep, pre you know, hoping for different experiences, and so forth and so on, forget it. You, know, you just keep going round and round. God, God bless it. God bless this, these samsaris who are trying to find satisfaction here. But um, you know, it's not a bad deal, but it's not a good deal either. It's just it's a non-starter. Life is a non-starter until you know who you are, and then it's so beautiful. It's just so amazing. It's just so fascinating and interesting and ever new, and. You know, and the the love. I mean, we haven't even got to the love side. Got a nice book called The Yoga of Love, which is a very advanced text on what it is to be enlightened. Because freedom means non-dual love. Love and and uh, existence and consciousness is non-dual love. And we explain the connection between all of these uh, words, these concepts. Obviously, if reality is non-dual and love exists, then, you know, reality is love, and love is reality. So, but that's a whole other topic we don't have tonight. Tonight, I was just promoting this book. It can't promote. We can't promote. If you're ready for this, you just find it. You know, I mean, I could sell ice to an Eskimo, but uh, you can't sell this. It's, it, it just it comes to you at the right time, it makes sense, and you're, you're excited by it, and you start to investigate, that's all. It's a simple thing. Right, thank you very much again. Okay, yeah. Hey. <laughs>